I'm going to talk about the day-to-day -day practice in, in Africa and how we can navigate evidence-based cancer care, even in the face of limited resources. We need to try and develop a high quality cancer care delivery system. This slide I'm showing you was published in 2014, quite a while ago, almost 10 years ago, where they look at the evidence base to form what we do with our patients and then um, learning from our information technology system. But then we always have to depend on the quality of our workforce by our previous presenters and also interaction with our patients and then where we interface with patient clinician interactions. That goes far beyond our daily practice and requires a lot of sacrifice, like Nazik said, in the face of a heavy clinic. But we realize that we need that to improve our practice. And with that, we are able to develop quality measurements that improve our outcomes. We're able to look at our um, what we need to do to improve our practice. And based on that, we are able to develop accessible, affordable quality care. But you can say that most of this is actually related to high income country. So what do we do where we are? So um, we know that evidence-based medicine is translating what the literature says, but we have to know that it's not just that. That is not the only thing that compromises evidence-based medicine. Data is vital, but it's just a component of producing evidence-based care. It must cast across all cancer guidelines in terms of the continuum, starting with prioritization of areas based on our registry data. So it might be difficult to adopt evidence-based medicine for everything, but our previous speakers have talked about early detection, about diagnosis, you know, and all of that. And we know most of us don't have the resources to actually embrace all of it at once, but I think a stepwise approach will be a good, a good way to start. It's easier to start in the clinics in terms of clinical care, but I think we have to remember that we, the best outcome would if we do it across the whole continuum. But we know that we have a lot of infrastructural gaps and more the reason why we need to tailor our recommendations to suit our situation, not just that, but including the situation of our patients. And I'll come a little bit to that. We have to know that we have varying economic strengths in Africa. Um, some are low and middle income, some are low income, some are upper middle income. So there's a mix, so of course, not one size doesn't fit all, but most importantly, we have to remember our cultures, the various religions and how they impact. I think you know most of this who practice in Africa will know what these are on everyday basis. All the same, um, traveling through Africa, we have a common ground in terms of beliefs and our attitudes to life. So this might help us to come together to decide on how to manage our patients. We also have other compounding health problems other than cancer, and that might limit what our governments are willing to invest into cancer care. But we have to remember that value is priority, and even in high-income countries that are supposedly have a lot of money actually really tout value in cancer care. Always remember that um, cancer care is the number one cause of bankruptcy, even in high-income countries, and even worse for us. We don't tend to measure it. There's not, not too much research on that, but I think it's something that we need to do a little bit more. And we need that to adopt universal health uh, coverage, which we must all do eventually, is to minimize waste and maximize benefits. And we can only do that through evidence-based medicine and reassessing our situation. Without evidence-based medicine, we cannot successfully implement universal health care. So what are the expected outcomes of evidence-based care? We improve the safety of our patients because we look at a, you know, a, a lot of trials have been done and then we know what our toxicity profiles are. And then I'll go a little bit into that later. Um, it has to be patient-centered. It has to be effective. The least detrimental treatment is what we're trying to choose for our patients. We need to tailor it to improve acceptability, not just to the patients, even across our workforce, to make it easier to implement. And the whole plan of all this is to improve outcomes. We also need a feedback look, a loop, sorry, regular evaluation through data collection and research, peer review, development of quality indicators, structured feedback, and the processes for implementing the changes that we observe while we are evaluating. This. Sometimes we just get the data and it hangs in there. So we're not able to feed that back into the system. This will build a stronger health system. And like I say, improve patient outcomes. So this is the broad scope of evidence-based care. What is the current status of evidence-based care in oncology as we are now? Unfortunately, most of the evidence that we have that supports um, treatment guidelines or process guidelines or processes are actually generated for high income countries. 
and you know they had a lot of um, setbacks with that. The area of interest dependent on the priorities of our agency. So right now, a lot of uh, um, guidelines uh, purport the use of targeted therapy, molecular targeted therapy, or processes that might not be available to us, like the previous speaker, uh, speaker spoke about um, targeted therapies and molecular testing. I'll get a little bit into that. Our disease burdens are totally different. So we concentrate on, we want, we are interested in certain areas while the West is con concentrating on different areas. Even within Africa, we have different priorities as well. And that um, needs to be um, um, discussed. The research that supports this um, um, evidence, unfortunately, might not be that stringent. They have weak endpoints, or um, everybody's talking about the fact that the endpoints are not strong enough. They are not tight. It's more like proposed or, or projected results. And, and there's a lot of industry rivalry, poorly designed trials, lack of diversity in the populations, especially to low to middle income countries. There, when also we have lack data or trials in LMSC to develop impactful guidelines within our societies. So unfortunately, we tend to actually depend most on, on, on uh, guidelines that are developed by high income with a totally different health um, system. New therapies, most of the new therapies run down budgets, even in, in countries that have um, um, high income compared to the rest of us. And also there's an increase in the healthcare bed because we have all these toxicities from these new treatments that nobody really talks about with very little um, impact in overall survival. But then we are so drawn to them because we think that is the best thing to do and it's the standard of care. So how do we look at that? That's why we talked a lot about critical appraisal. So for me, the main three components of evidence-based practice, I circle the utilize the best external. I think this slide fits us better external evidence. Most people draw the evidence for themselves, like in high income countries. For us, we have to use external evidence because we don't develop our own. And we actually base it and then based on our individual clinical expertise or institutional or regional clinical expertise, we also need to consider the patient values and expertise. I think that is really missing in the way we practice our oncology in most of Africa myself included, we tend to ignore the patient's value issues. We rather want to be the latest kid on the block. We want to use the newest technologies, which unfortunately might not be that beneficial and cause a lot of medical harm. So all that said, how do we integrate evidence into our practice effectively? Can we rely on the current evidence available to implement in low, medical, low, low, low to middle income countries like Africa? Do we need to develop our own evidence? Do we have a shared decision making? And why is it so important to have a shared decision making with the patients? Why is clinical expertise vital? Is the workforce ready to adopt um, evidence-based care? And I think Nazik had spoken a lot about that, so I wouldn't go there. But we have to realize that it's very important to discuss with the patient why you are prescribing a drug, the expected side effects, and let the person tell you there and then whether it is affordable or not. For those of us who don't have universal health care, Unfortunately, this is very important. In countries that don't have, do have universal health care, this might be a problem because they just prescribe because it's available. So we actually think we are doing the patient a favor. But I think these are things that we have to go back to the drawing board and look at. What are the gaps to generating high quality research in places like Africa? We have a poor research culture. And what are the reasons why? We have a high patient burden per doctor. It's like pulling out your hair, really trying to develop research, you don't get supported, you don't have the advancements to make it easy. I know people who churn out like 10 papers a week. We don't even have that luxury. We don't even have the data. We don't record the correct data. We don't have the funding. We don't even have our own funding, let alone the institutional funding or external. We don't even have time to apply for grants. We, have, we don't have research-friendly government or institutional policies that will promote people who just do even sacrifice to do this kind of research or promote grants writing or even make available these funding. And there also there's an unbalanced predatory global collaborative research partnerships. So our, our studies are not even being published. The so-called high impact journals don't accept our publications. The editors are skewed because most of the editors on the boards don't have people from low to middle income. This is changing with some journals, but I think broadly they are still you know, issues that have to be sorted out. So these are the reasons why our research doesn't go up. Not only that, you can't even present them at conferences to even be considered. 
when they are looking at the critical appraisal for development of guidelines, because we can't even get the visas. We, our face is like in, in the background. So these are some of the reasons why we can't generate the quality research for ourselves. This is a, a, a slide showing a study from um, um, looking at why uh, evidence-based practice is, is, is not, is not um, um, viable in some institutions. For example, this is a slide from North Ethiopia published about four, five years ago. And they looked at why the, why the barriers were. And they saw that hospital infrastructure, computers, internet, I'm sure we all identify with this, are not adequate. There's a lack of training in evidence-based practice. And I think this is something that resonates across most of us. It's not in our curriculum. It's not in our competency guidelines. It's not, it's not in our promotion evaluation. I think these are things that we have to look at as to why we need to adopt these practices to improve what we do. There are problems understanding English. So there also actually is a gap in, in, in literacy because we have different countries, Francophone, Anglophone, uh, Anglophone, Francophone, Lusophone. All these things make it a little bit difficult for people to understand. So these have to be translated or maybe there are previous. Uh, um, so the French need to have translated guidelines. I remember I was trying hard to get NCCN to do a translation for the Francophone African countries, and it's not that easy. So these are just typical examples. Patient illiteracy is a big problem because I just talked about us discussing these things with the patient. When the patient doesn't understand what you're saying, how do you translate some medical terms into basic language? And the translator actually has their own translation into what they tell the patient. That is from my practical experience. So this actually hampers the progress. Then no patient awareness of the whole disease trajectory also makes it difficult for them to understand. There's no patient education. There's insufficient, there's sufficient information to find guidelines yes there is but then access to the internet even the patients can't seem to go on the internet or they can't even understand what they are, they are looking at um orientation about new health issues and even priority areas in cancer control there's actually there's a general lack of that there's not sufficient time to find protocols online oncologists will do that because that is part of the training but we have a lot of supportive physicians who are not oncologists, and that is one of our biggest gaps. How do we encourage them to do continuous life learning to find out these new studies? Um, treatment guidelines and protocols are not that easy to come by. That is national. We tend to rely more on the international. I did a study on breast cancer, and everybody used guidelines somehow or the other. Um, that's from aortic, so they tend to be more of a specialized group of people. But most of them relied on international guidelines and not local guidelines. I think the possible reasons could be the, the oncologists were not part of the guideline development. They are actually developed by the policy makers rather or non-oncologists because they decide what is to be done. And these are all factors that might uh, prevent adoption of, of um, electronic, uh, sorry, of um, um, evidence-based medicine. Also our culture, we know that already. We don't change our practice. We like to stick with the old norm. Um, we lack the authority in the workplace to change practice. There's a hierarchy, a leadership hierarchy, and that is a, they are, we are not allowed to innovate. And these are some of our problems as well, being able to adapt what is from outside to our situations, and that is common among us as well. Hospital managers should support this. It has to be like from policy, from the ministries, from the local institutions, and in the universities to make, not just in cancer, but across other disease sites. And I heard um, Nazik talking about the, the, the evidence-based guidelines for blood transfusion, and I was really excited about that because I see that as a big gap, okay? And then also interdisciplinary discussion with patients are not really done in most of our institutions. So these are the possible barriers that we have. Then let's look at resource stratified guidelines. We talked about the guidelines from high income countries maybe might not be adaptable to us, plus all our many you know, negatives as to why we can't adopt them. So should we look at resource stratified guidelines? This started with the um, Breast Health Global Initiative where the basic care, uh, uh, maximal and advanced care. So it was, but a lot of people have a lot of negatives about this. Some people say, why are you, um, why are you supporting suboptimal care? But we know what the realistics are of the situation. Okay, so how do we, do we really have to do resource stratified guidelines? Do we have to adopt them? Because this resource stratified guidelines look at the access to therapies. There's no point in somebody who lives 100 miles from the second center or the main radiotherapy center or oncology center or even screening center. You know, so what can you do for this patient? What is the bare minimum that is evidence-based? 
okay, to reduce the morbidity from this, this. You might not change the mortality, but at least you can change the morbidity from it. It looks at equity through the lens of economies of scale, which other people will know. Because I know a lot of people will say, why can't you have this treatment in your center? Why can't you do this? They don't understand the other um, competing interests that we have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. It also looks at the cost effectiveness of treatment. The cost effectiveness is, is more cost effective when it's up to three times your, your, your GDP. But most of us are actually way out in terms of our cancer therapies. So most things are actually not cost effective. So these are the things you have to, when we talk about value care, these are the things that have to be considered with so many other things that come along. The workforce trends, we talked about that earlier. Some of these resource stratified guidelines might not include the most updated information on the subject, just because it's not affordable. But I think it could be done in such a way that the options are there for and against, and then you decide based on the circumstance in which you are in. Unfortunately, most of these resource stratified guidelines are still crafted by experts from high income countries. It means we need to take the bull by the horns ourselves to make this happen, to make this realistic. And finally, we, most of us don't have the funding for it, but I think if we come together as like, um, there's an African problem about using the boom, one stick doesn't do anything, but many sticks are able to sweep the debt away. So this is something that we could consider because by them still guiding the evidence-based guidelines, we still have caveats and we are not being able to, to, you know, to, to adjust these. So what is the current state of stratified guidelines for Sub-Saharan Africa? We have the local health, and this was the basis of all stratified girl. I think it's a lovely thing. Everybody has their opinions about it. We also have the Af African Cancer Coalition, which was started as an NCCN sub-Saharan group, where all African um, experts sit together. This time is not led by high-income countries. They are just there as a guide, and they're actually surprised uh, how much the African oncologist knows. The only problem is access to the treatments. And then we tell them, you cannot do this in my country because of this. And it's been resonate along most African countries. Of course, we have some countries that have more facilities than the other. That's always a debate. But we also have options. If you have it, you do it. If you don't have it, this is what you do to improve your patient outcomes. I think this is one of the things that have to be emulated. Then we have the ASCO resource stratified guidelines, but that's just for low middle income countries, not special for Africa. So those are things that we need to look up over time. Then we have our regional and local guidelines which are missing. There are very few countries outside of North and South Africa that have developed their own local guidelines. Kenya has as well, and other countries as well. But I think we need to adopt more of this. That looks at the real situation. So I don't have VMAX, but somebody else has VMAX. So somebody talked about cyber knife, I think in one of the countries, was it Brazil? Uh, SBRT, it cannot be in our guidelines because we don't have SBRT, or maybe people might not have access to SBRT. So these are the things that might help to improve these resource stratified guidelines. And there are so many other um, examples that can be given. What are the missing, what are we missing in the current uh, resource stratified guidelines in Sub-Saharan Africa? Implementation research, I'm, I'm sorry, I got cut off somewhere. Implementation research, adaptable evidence blocks to guide value. So you have, for example, the use of plaquetaxel uh, or adriamycin in the treatment, in the adjuvant treatment of ovarian cancer. Indeed, if you look at the guidelines, if you look at the, the papers, a critical appraisal of the randomized clinical trials, the, actually the overall survival, this is free survival, was the same. The only difference is it was it was more toxic. Adriamycin was more toxic. That's why carbotaxel was accepted as an alternative to um, um, adriamycin and cisplat. So, in the NCCN guidelines, for example, you have evidence blocks, but these were not developed for what we have as guidelines for Sub-Saharan Africa. And I think this will help us to make the right decisions based on the patients and the resource available. The leadership of these guidelines has to be by the end users. It cannot be any other way because we have different um, health system strengths and peculiarities, including culture, okay? Our local governments haven't really endorsed these I know they really don't understand what these guidelines are, but we need to do more to make sure that this is accepted and is practiced. And even the general surgeon who's helping us to do our breast cancer cases can actually log into these resource guidelines to help to improve outcomes, or there should be discussions you know, in, in that direction. The updates of resource has to be done with local experts. 
not any other way by somebody else updating these guidelines because we know what the current situation and things are rapidly moving in africa things are getting better in terms of the oncology field we get more very high quality oncologists being trained on the continent so things are actually getting better and i think we should be able to take ownership of these we also need to have patient reported outcomes and these are completely missing i'll say it's part of implementation research but i separated it out because it's something that we really don't have in our in our guidelines in our in our practices to see how these treatments, we know we have individual experiences out there. And unfortunately, right now, they are level four and five evidence because we are not publishing, we are not coming together to talk about these. You know, that impacts how we accept treatments that are, are, are given to us from, from high income country. So there's a lot that we need to do. Okay, I think that local guideline development should be part of national cancer control planning, including the regular updates. I think that's where it will be more acceptable to most people to make sure that these are for the most important cancers. Of course, we can't do it for everything, but we can do it for the most important cancers. And I think this will help to drive us forward. If it's drawn by us, we know what our limitations are. We know what we've done with our local expertise to improve the implementation of evidence-based guidelines where we are. Why do we need implementation science research? Why is it so critical for us? Because based, looking, at the looking at the implementation science research, We'll be able to identify the gaps on the broad way we know that okay we have to give everybody accepting for a two positive breast cancer do we need nine weeks do we need six months do we need 12 months we don't even have the evidence what we know is that there's a lot of cardiotoxicity so have we sat down to collate our results to say look let's take the bull by the hands this is what we have what can we do to improve the outcome of our patients? I think the worst thing is to cause your patients a morbidity of incurable cancer from your treatments. So these are, these are specific, these are cytogenomics. We haven't done that. We haven't looked at the diversity, the differences in uptake of our Herceptin. We have not done anything, we just adopt. And I think these are very big gaps that could be elucidated by you know, um, constructive, uh, critical implementation science research. Rigorous high quality, I think it's important that we get together to do that. It also drives the impetus to innovate. We do that in our clinics one-on-one, -on -one, but it needs to be a, a collective agreement, you know, led by African oncologists. We know there are not enough of us, but believe me, from what I see, in the next decade or two, there are going to be a whole lot of us. And I think we should be able to drive our own agenda to improve the outcomes of our, of our patients, not just adopting because epiluluma, we are all happy to use epilumab and nivolumab. How much does it add to our patients? How much does it break their grand? How many of the grandkids cannot go to school because of epilumab? Or even need to sit down and look at all this. If it's affordable, if there's a universal health coverage for this, I have no problem with it. But when the patient has to pay for it, then it's a different scenario. So you see how things are different for us. With the implementation, we may be able to guide safety. So you know that our patients don't have a very good reaction to some of the drugs. So it's difficult to give a particular type of drug to an African patient. So like they ha we have a lot of neutropenia, our average white cell count is two. So you see where the problem is already. So it's difficult to give certain drugs. So we have the guideline, we have implemented it. What does it look like? We haven't gone back to see how our patients are tolerating it. The effectiveness on the treatment in our societies, we have biodiversity. We, we, the, the Asians have done that. They know you have to use low dose cape sites a bit. What have we done in our societies to see the most effective way of dealing with these drugs? Can we replicate what has been recommended? Can we scale it up? Is it cost effective to scale it back so that there's equity in our treatments? So this is why we need implementation research to guide our, our knowledge. Let's look at clinical scenarios. So I'll try and use the, the most common. Most of you have talked about most of this, I'll glide through. So in terms of early diagnosis, we have to have um, a culturally sensitive approach to join patients to come for screening and early diagnosis. We, we, we tend to frighten them a lot. So how do we, we need to package these messages and we need survivors to help to do this. There's evidence that it works. So I think it's something that we are using young children to, to draw our, our, our people to come. And this is evidence that that was done for diagnosis or seat belts, using of seat belts in cars. And when the children were educated to train their parents, more people did use their seat belts in their car. These are things that haven't been translated into oncology where we are. How feasible are mammograms? We talked about this already. It is not. Okay, so what do we do? Where, where is the gap? We talked about this already. 
we need to adopt research from other low to middle income countries. So India had a large trial that showed a clinical breast exam actually gave very good results for patients above the age of 50. So these are things that we can harness on and other countries can actually replicate this or not to see the impact of this. And also my previous um, speaker talked about the role of genetic counseling. It is not an easy subject to talk about because of our cultural ability. So we need a lot of education to brace this. And then even when we do the tests, do we have the inputs, you know, and, and are these patients going to follow up? What are the cultural impacts? Where are the, are the spiritualists going to harness from this? So these are things that we in, and come up with the correct way of doing this. In terms of staging, we've said it most of the time, it's mandatory to have histology, immunohistochemistry, and HER2. It doesn't matter if you can't afford HER2 testing. It helps you to prognosticate your patient, to know what to do next. Like we said, we know now that the guideline says we should use new adjuvant for for triple negative. But if you don't know that it's triple negative, how do you even do anything at all? So that is this is why we need this test. Unfortunately, again, for my study on the updates of breast cancer, not many um, um, African countries are actually doing IXC or the full battle of it. And I think these are things that needs to be encouraged. Unfortunately, somebody mentioned that we are doing private um, pathology. Unfortunately, that is what is giving us the answers. So that is where the governments are losing out and missing out. How do we advocate for partnerships? These are things to look at. Clinical exam is still, fight, is still vital. We all go straight to CT scan, MRI, without even touching the patient. And these are very cost-effective methods. Helps you to, to tailor which treatment, when to do a bone scan. Not everybody who comes to your clinic needs a bone scan. If there's an uh, evidence that there is uh, uh, organ involvement, is then you go ahead and you do it. The appropriate tools of staging should be based on the resources. And finally, those of us who have to pay out of pocket, you can ask the patient whether they can afford it. Because I've seen that patients, I guess, because go and do an MRI without asking whether they can afford it. He goes out of the door and never comes back. That affects your practice as well. If you go back and do your um, outcome survey, you realize that you're missing out. So patients are not coming back to the clinic. The question is why? Because we have to adjust the evidence based on our resources, and we don't seem to be doing that. We also have to consider the patient factors. Okay, is a CT scan available to that particular patient? Do they have insurance to cover that CT scan? So again, in areas that have universal healthcare, it's different. For those who don't have it, it's different as well. So it has to be tailored to your community. Patient's choice. If she says, I'm not going to do it, there's nothing you can do about it. Okay, so these are, they don't prescribe it in that case and cause more stress for the patient and the family. So these are things that we have to look at. In terms of treatment for breast cancer, we all say we need MDT. We know MDT is not easy. The problems with MDT in Africa is that apart from the colleges, everybody else is not a specialist. They don't understand what the oncology principles are. It needs a lot of education. And that's the thing that we should be willing to impart knowledge to our, our, our peers. But the difference I see most of the time is that they don't really attend the oncology conferences that we do. They are not updated you know, on these um, um, procedures and processes and interventions that improve patient's outcome. So it is our responsibility to teach them and show them the evidence out there and why it's applicable. I've had a lot of queries that this, this guideline you're saying, it applies to high income. Why are you asking me to do this? Then I have to say, in my clinic, this is what we've seen. But because I'm not publishing this. So again, we are not developing the evidence. But we can also use the levels of evidence to show this um, um, our colleagues, why this should not be done and why this should, should be done and use our clinical judgments. That is why expertise is important. Where you train, that's what makes it different. Sequencing of treatment for breast cancer, it's a big issue. Like we said, the guidelines now say use new adjuvant for, for triple negative breast cancer beyond stage 1A or B or whatever. But a non-oncologist surgeon sees the patient first and gets the first thing they do is to take out the breast without even consulting. So I think treatments have to be guided, you know, by oncology principles. That's just it. There are general surgeons who are very good at oncology principles. They are willing to be taught and you should engage them to iron out their controversies. They really are a lot of controversies, but I think it's our duty to make sure that they have the correct tools and the correct, you know, uh, knowledge and information to make this happen. Managing toxicities. So th there are so many choices now for chemotherapy, all right? So many choices now for chemotherapy. But for us, we've said this already. So docetaxel, I love docetaxel, but it causes a lot of neutropenia. Can my patients afford prophylactic GCSF? That's the question. Am I going to continue to dose reduce? I cannot do 
those tens chemotherapy for my breast cancer patients because they can't afford lipogen or the emergency rooms are not responsive enough. So the, uh, my, the toxicities are going to be a problem. Okay, uh, maybe I am not responsive enough. The system is not responsive enough. So I need to be careful the choice of treatment that I give. All right. Psycho-oncology, there's a lot that goes into breast cancer treatment, fertility, loss of uh, uh, imaging, loss of spouse, uh, income, loss of your hair, so many things. And I think we are missing out on the use of psycho-oncology. That is where you need the patient factors. And you have the chance to educate the patients and the families about how these you know, should go. And so based on the evidence, we can actually also come out with reasons why our patients do not come for their treatments. It's very common in Africa. So just by doing this, we are able to generate the evidence and see where to adjust, how to, how to change the messaging and how to counsel our patients, okay? Patient factors, so the patient lives far away. You don't want to do a weekly chemotherapy, no. Also, patients who are ERP are positive, purely luminal A, tend to get a lot of chemotherapy. The guidelines don't support this. Or it should be done under clinical trial setting. Or go back and do your research to see whether you improve patient outcomes or not. And so these are the things that we should look at in our societies. In the limited resource, we need to match up what is out there to what we have in us, and then develop the data as well. And we also have the health system factors. I'm not going to go into that. Let's look at prostate cancer. He talked about that, the, the levels of evidence. It now says we shouldn't do screening for prostate cancer. I don't know whether we should do a DRE or not. We have a lot of BPH as well. So we need to standard laboratory techniques. So the only specific labs that I can do PSA screening in, in Ghana. So that's the first thing. We need to standardize the laboratory techniques. We also look at the role of genetic counseling. So we now know that um, uh, you have BRCA in, 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 in prostate cancer as well, and they also have a risk of developing pancreatic cancer. How, 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 how easy is it to convince the families to do a genetic study? I haven't had that much success. They don't want, in the African doesn't want to know what doesn't bother them. Why are you looking for trouble? That is what they say. So how do we package this? How do we come up with messages? But we don't have any systemic, systematic way of doing this. And if you want to adopt the evidence, really have to sit down and talk. But even just verbally discussing this with the patient gives them some alerts. And sometimes it does trigger down, down the line. But I think we are far off with that. We are now developing a lot of genetic counselors, but I think we need to know how to then do it properly. Staging, substandard treatment without prognostication. We all know that. If you don't know the PSA, you don't know the stage, you don't know all that, then you are not treating the patients properly. Some patients even get um, 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 hormone therapy even before anything is decided on. I think that is not good. We need new nomograms for Africa. So we can you know, use all these new therapies that we are seeing in, in the evidence. You know, um, Somebody was even talking about use of immunotherapy for, for prostate cancer. We cannot afford it. Okay, but our patients come with very high PSAs. Have we looked at our data to see what it means? Obviously, the number of don't work. Because as far as I'm concerned, everybody has high risk prostate cancer, but the outcomes are not the same. So have we sat down to look at our data, you know, uh, with each other to see what we can do for these patients? Okay, they don't like to have, uh, what do you call it, uh, um, um, all kinds of tests or all types, types of intervention. We have to be culturally sensitive about it. Clinical exam is still very vital. The appropriate tools has to be used for staging. We know we'd like to do the MRI and all of that. Can your patient afford this? That can the system cover this to make sure your patient is financially covered? So it all depends on where you are. Like I said, whether this is appropriate or not, and whether the patient will avail themselves afterwards. And then patient factors, cost, travel. It's not just the cost of the intervention, but there are other non-medical costs that you need to consider. Okay, when you're staging your patient, as much as possible, you're guided by the evidence, you educate the patient that this is what I'm supposed to do and document why the patient cannot do it. And but inform them that without that, you cannot effect appropriate therapies. So it's, it's, it's not that simple, really. In terms of treatment, I think the treatments of prostate cancer before any intervention should be guided by an MDT led by an oncologist. I think this is missing. Most MDTs are not led by oncologists. So I don't even know why they call it you know, uh, uh, tumor board, really. Now, the role of surveillance is part of the uh, choosing wisely recommendations. Um, but most actually African men do not accept surveillance. Question is why? Have we done any anthropology research as to why? Are they really, do they have an informed decision or they just don't want to do it? If we, I think if we sat down and explained to them, they would take it up. But again, our, our, um, our volumes are so high that we really don't have the time. But these are things that we might have to get uh, um, what do you call it? 
tax shifting to get other people to do this education to help them because this actually saves a lot of waste you know as well um, but i know african men don't don't want to just undergo surveillance the choice of therapies should be appropriate for the stage so we have a lot of early stage um, prostate cancers who are getting hormone therapy or they are on hormone therapy for years before they are referred for treatment this is not in the guideline and i think we as oncologists or policy makers need to help to make sure that it actually reduces a lot of risk. And we all know that hormone therapy has now a lot of medical side effects. That also increases the burden of the disease and the cost of care, which we have to carry out. And even the human resource, because most of these patients have you know, mobilities and they can't give their full quota to the development of the countries. We all forget this. You know, and even their families, their children suffer because they can't do any work. It goes really far beyond what we can think. The sequencing of therapies. So like we said, unfortunately, we are guided by a lot of financial gains. Somebody mentioned that. We can't do anything about it in Africa because our salaries in the government system are very low. So you need to have public, um, uh, private partnership to be able to end to, to meet, ends meet. You, you understand, but while we are doing that, are we educating our colleagues? We still need time for our private primary practices to improve the outcomes. We need to educate our colleagues. They get angry with you at first, but we have to explain to them that actually the results are actually detrimental when you use, and, and they are not cheap. I'll also go to the, uh, the use of orchidectomy versus hormone therapy. It is less toxic, but I think it has its own problems. And culture is that even a 93 year widowed man who will not want to have an orchidectomy. And, and our male colleagues sometimes do not discuss orchidectomy because of these cultural differences and all of that. These are things that we haven't published. It happens in our daily lives, but we are not publishing that to help to guide our treatments. We also don't discuss the cost of these treatments with these patients. Okay, and also the use of uh, um, 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 calcium in patients who are on hormone therapy because they tend to have fractures, hypocalcemia. We all forget about that. And these are things that we have to remember. And these are tiny things that don't cost any money, but will improve our outcomes. How do we manage toxicities? You also have to think that before you give your hormone therapy, you have to do your baseline tests. Like in the guideline, these are things that are simple and shouldn't cost any money. It shouldn't derail your, your, your financial you know, uh, capital or budget. For, these are simple things. You need to look at the patient factors and the system factors to decide on how you treat your, your patient. If the hormone therapy is free, hail presto, but it doesn't mean you should give it beyond where it is recommended. We need to look at things like Intermittent hormone therapy, even the metastatic setting, there is some benefit. It spares the patient the cost, one, and number two, also the quality of their lives. And these are things that we, we don't adopt, but it's something that we should look at. We have low resources, and yet we don't harness really you know, on this. Example is also the use of, um, we have new therapies, abiraterum and zalutamide. These are all available everywhere because of generics. But how to sequence them and when to, I think we haven't really looked at that to see what benefits us. Okay, we just prescribe it because it's there. Unfortunately, yeah, most of the people who are prescribing these medications are not oncologists. But I think, again, we need to make sure that we have evidence-based practice inculcated in the policy of the institutions where we work. I think that is what is missing because it's free for all. Everybody can do you know, anything. We also talk about the use of choosing between abiratron and docetaxel. What is the difference? For me, the difference is that for docetaxel, I stop after a couple of cycles, maybe up to eight, 10. But for abiraterum, I'm going to keep going on. And the cost is also you know, quite um, um, uh, prohibitive, OK? And also, we also talked about, other people talk about low dose abiraterum. It hasn't worked for me. But I think we should all come together and do a trial to see whether it works for us and see whether there's something that we can do. I think even a quarter of the dose has worked for some institutions. But we haven't replicated this where we need it most in Africa. And I think these are things we just adopt what is from outside and the insurance companies or the government is paying for it without looking at other alternatives. I think these are things that we need to consider. Patient factors, systemic factors. Don't write abiraterum until you've discussed with the patient whether they can afford it. Are you willing to try the low dose? It should be done in a context of a clinical trial, you know, or, or to, 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 you are going to um, document that data to see whether it works for your patients or not. Okay, so these are things that um, um, we should look at. For cervical cancer, we talked about that. I'm not going to go into that about, about but unfortunately, somehow, I think Gabby was able to get um, HPV vaccine at $1. Uh, 
but uh, my country did not uptake it. The question is that one dollar per space, so many thousands of dollars and quality of life, human resource, you know, uh, things. But I mean, there's policy and they don't invite anybody to discuss these things. But these are things that need to be, you need to look at the cost effectiveness of these methods. HPV, DNA, self-collection, and is pap smear out of the window? Maybe it is. It's better for us because it was too expensive and too cumbersome. But then the rest of it has to be done properly. What happens to the patients far away after they have the DNA positive? Are they followed up the correct way? Are they getting their true? Um, maybe for a country like Rwanda that has complete universal health coverage, it's easier. They have almost 100% coverage of HPV vaccination for their admission. Some of us don't. In fact, our governments never even took it up in the first place. You know, so these are how do we impact this? If we write, if we publish, I think these are things that can down the line would inform, you know, um, uh, pol policy, I think down the line. Okay, now in terms of staging cervical cancer, we now know that for many years, the guidelines said you don't need to do a CT scan. We were happy for those of us in low resources, but that's a lot of money and we treated our patients. We went back and looked at our data, at least from Ghana, and we saw that patients with one, two, one A, stage one, one A, were doing very well, even with two dimensional and low dose rate brachytherapy. Our stage 3B patients, on the other hand, were not doing well. So we thought it was, you know, so many factors. We're not doing things right. The brachytherapy was not right. Then we started adopting the use of CT scans for staging our patients who we think are high risk. And here, presto, 70% of them actually have paraaortic nodes. So all these patients would have been overtreated or undertreated. They might not get the right sequence of so staging the correct staging is very important the cost of staging is another issue but i think if you convince your patient that this is required for the correct treatments i think it's something that will go along it doesn't have to be for everybody and for we, we have to maybe innovate different ways of maybe looking at the priority lymph nodes or the pelvic lymph nodes and also because sometimes you ask them to do a scan they go out of the window and they never come back but i think the education is where the patient uh, factors we need to talk to the patients about and educate them about how to do the appropriate tools have to be used based on resources. We know that MRI is the best for uh, for for treating C of the cervix. However, how many people have access to MRIs? Okay, so you might just have to settle with your CT scan and use it for your radiotherapy planning because we are not doing a lot of us are not doing MRI planning yet. So the patient doesn't have to do two CT scans. You know, I think we need to think about the patient factors as well. But we tend to be just go straight for the guideline and go ahead and treat the patient or prescribe you know uh, medications that the patient might not be able to afford. Again, MDT is required. Most people just go out and take out the uterus, leave chemo behind. It's very difficult to explain to our surgeons that the balkan is not the way to go. There's no point in leaving anything behind. It might as well not teach the patient. We have these gaps in our, our management of cancers. The choice of a therapies should be appropriate for the stage. A lot of people are adopting new adjuvant chemotherapy for CA, um, cervix. Unfortunately, the data does not support this. However, the argument is that we have a lot of locally advanced disease. Might that impact practice? Maybe what was done outside was a small was studies that was mainly promoted by the Ghanaian oncologists, hoping that they would not need to do radiotherapy, but it actually didn't work, but it actually backfired. So now let's do a structured program in our environment, coming together collectively to see what the outcomes are. I know some, some of our oncologists in, in, in Kenya are doing this. And I think we should publish this data, like even an abstract for all of us to actually uptake in our institution to see whether we really did change anything. So we might have to adjust the pattern because of our, our disease burdens and our disease patterns. So it might be different from what the West says. The West doesn't have too much of CA cervix. We do. So actually, we should be the leaders in how these treatments are managed in low resource countries. The sequencing is important. You always need to look at patient factors, and we need local regional research to inform best evidence-based um, practice. This is a little different. I'll go into colon cancer and I'll say colon cancer, there's been a lot that's going on in colon cancer. And um, this was published in 2020, looking at what has come on over the past, I think is it eight, eight years or more, um, 18 years. We've moved from um, epidemic growth factor, targeted therapies, all to immunotherapy and even combined immunotherapy. Okay, and I think we are even beyond this now. All right, but, in terms of metastatic breast um, um, colon cancer, how much has this added? Let's look at the other um, um, figure that was published so many years ago, 14 years ago. That showed that for metastatic breast cancer, just with 5-FU, it will take an or even the adding of a targeted therapy, 
you can get more, almost two years of a median survival. All right. Now, with all these new therapies, when you added targeted therapy, you only actually added like between two to four months median survival. All right. If the patient is MSI high, all right, or is, uh, um, um, uh, what do you call it, um, mismatch repair, they'll respond to the targeted therapy, the immunotherapy, and you might be able to add another 10 months to their median survival. Okay, but if the patient is not, now the issue is also the testing is also expensive. But if the patient is a farmer in the village, really, are they going to be able to afford these treatments? So are you going to do this test? So there's a lot of ethical issues around adopting high income uh, guidelines into our societies. I think the best thing is to graduate it according to resource stratified. And also if the patient can afford it, you should have that option. I think that's important in every country that there should be various options based on what the patient can get. So I think that is very you know, important. We should look at all of this. So looking at colorectal cancer, Culturally sensitive approach, I think fecal ochre blood might be the way to go. Uh, we need to educate the public health worker, um, public care, sorry, primary care physicians, because they are the ones who refer the patient. But then the screening is not done at the appropriate time. There's no high index of suspicion. Patients over 50 years old with anemia are not being investigated for colon cancer. And then these are things that evidence is, I think, is very you know, low hanging fruit that can be done. But we've talked about that. the role of genetic testing because we know we have a lot of genetics and colon cancer and so many other cancers. How do we integrate it into our daily practice? How do we pick up patients and prevent cancer in these um, populations? In terms of staging, again, substandard staging, treatment without staging. So we have a lot of patients who have bleeding per rectum. They open up and take out the, the, the before the CT scan is done to realize that they have lung meds, liver meds, and all that. If it's an emergency, and for most of our patients come out at emergencies, but if not, it can't be a staged. Uh, but we don't do that because the guest take out, everybody thinks surgery is the most important thing. While well, the guidelines don't say that. I think sitting down at an MDT to discuss on how the sequence with available resources we know we can actually improve the lives of our patients. Molecular profiling, do we need that for everybody? I think it depends on the cost, it depends on access and whether you can actually um, 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 have these treatments. In, is it ethical to do these tests when you can't do anything about it because the patient can't afford it? It's, it's very difficult. Patient factors, system factors, you have to remember, and all these also have their toxicity. So I think it, you can guide the evidence based on uh, availability and your patient whether they can afford it or not, okay? Because you might be able to and, and, and educate them as well. Um, so MDT, the choice of treatment has to be appropriate. You're not gonna give targeted therapy for early. We are not there yet, but I think eventually we might be. We can do simple things like circulating DNA that has come as a good way of differentiating between um, uh, low risk versus high risk stage two, colorectal cancer. So you can spend the benefit of chemotherapy in that group is only 5%. You know, but we tend to just write like a full spectrum of you know combination therapy for this treatment. We write without going through what can we do to, to improve the life of this patient. Chemotherapy is expensive and has a lot of toxins, but we tend to just adapt the guideline and just plug it in without looking. Oh, we can't afford MSSI, we can't afford you know uh, what do you call it? Uh, DMMR. So let's just give the patient the full, but I think we might be causing more harm. And these and we can spare a lot of money that we to the system. Maintenance therapies, is it affordable? How much does it influence our patients? How much does it improve their outcomes? These are things to look at. We haven't done that in our societies to see whether we should or not. Sequencing of therapies, new adjuvant versus no new adjuvant, all of that. Again, patient factors, system factors, and then local research to inform the best way to manage our patients. People get upset when we say, well, colorectal, metastatic colorectal, we start with just five of your plan, like de novo, with all these drugs first before I, I do my molecular for now, I'll do it later. Because the patient told me they can't afford it, so I'm not going to add it, you know. And maybe the, the, the system does not pay for it either. Some countries, they do, others they don't. So then you have to apply the evidence based on your clinical local practice and then the patient factors to come up with the best way of managing the patient with the evidence. And I think you should write it down. I think that is what is missing. In terms of palliative care, levels of evidence, we don't refer for palliative care and support. We just keep, we hold on to these patients for too long. And I think it's a big, it's a, the evidence does not support that. They do better with every referral. We don't have the workforce to support palliative care. It's, it's a big problem. We have to decentralize palliative care. I think uh, we need to engage the community as well. In terms of pain management, policy influences that. So we have a barrage of pain medications. Morphine is central. 
they don't have enough morphine. There's a lot of stigma. We have cultural inhibitions. We can't manage the toxicities and the um, stigma. So we need a lot of research how to make sure that we can improve the management of pain in our patients. In terms of radiotherapy for palliative care, I think they should be discussed at MPT. The timing, so some people keep the patients for too long before they refer because they are not aware of the evidence that if the patient has bone metastasis or spinal cord compression, they have to be treated within a certain window. So they keep the patients for two weeks waiting to have an MRI, which the patient cannot afford anyway, and then miss the opportunity to improve, I mean, make the patient able to work or control their urea or their stool. So these are things that, you know, these are little low hanging fruit that can be corrected based on, you know, um, um, how we interact with our, our peers. Sequencing of treatments, the dose, single versus multiple fraction. Unfortunately, we still think more is best. There's so much evidence that more is not better. Okay, just like the new medicines, they are not all better than the old medications. But you won't know that until you do the research, you know, and look at research from other countries similar to yours. They actually inform us better than taking it from, you know, high income countries. The use of radionuclides, patient factors, systemic factors. If the patient lives, 100 miles away, you don't want them to come every day for treatment for even five days. It's detrimental to their health and their psychology, please. And then cost, even if it's covered, the social part is never covered by most African countries. So it's something to remember. Okay, if the outcomes are the same, why not? You know, so these are things that we can do. So there are missed opportunities. Surveillance, clinical visits, we let them come too quickly. I think evidence, um, COVID taught us a lot. However, we don't follow these COVID guidelines. We've all gone back to our own, our old ways, you know. So I think it's something that can, the evidence is, is there as to what to do with, with the clinic visits. And yet we still come, let them come every month. I don't know what for. Okay, we need to actually also do MDT maybe, maybe um, um, workforce assets. We can decentralize these uh, visits. So they only come when they have specific problems. We need to educate our primary care uh, workers so they can help us to, to, because we can't manage them in the clinic you know, no other. They are coming too quickly. In terms of diagnostic, we should follow the evidence, the resource appropriateness. So even though the evidence shows that we should not do CA 125 as a, a follow-up for CA over everybody still does it. The reason why it causes too much stress, both to the patient and yourself. Okay, it's not necessary. You, oh, the difference wasn't much when you waited, so they had a symptom before you did the CA 125. Secondly, we tend to do this, you know, routine um, 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 CT scans, radiological imaging, whatever for I really don't know. Looking for something that is not there. For once, I'll say that. Because <laughs> it actually messes up with the patient's mind as well. So I think we need to be careful and adopt the evidence. These are things actually that we should be adopted instead of wasting. So it's not only, it's, we are low resource, but we don't seem to be harnessing on the positives. So this, let me go into the paradoxical scenarios. Most of you mentioned that already, but just to harness on it. No adjuvant, adjuvant, starting chemo before immunohistochemistry. Using targeted therapy without biomarker testing, multi agent chemotherapy for low risk stage two, without discussing with the patients the, the, the opportunities and the benefits or not. Low value targeted therapies without supporting local evidence. There's no evidence that it works. So, if you want to do it in your society, then it has to be under a clinical trial. I think the drug companies are guilty of that. So, something is not like atelizumab is not approved for. And even Avastin is not approved for metastatic breast cancer, and yet they come here and make sure that you use it. And we are happy to use it either. And most of us say it doesn't work, and yet we are not doing anything about it. Surveillance, CA-125, asymptomatic patients, they're undergoing radiological screening, I don't know what for. Palliative care, surveillance, radiological testing, they are metastatic, and yet we are still looking for something, I don't know what. If they are asymptomatic, I think you should just leave them alone. Primary local, it's not me, the evidence supports that. And, um, Primary uh, local resection in stage four disease, unless it's for a, a therapeutic intervention, it really should not be done. It's also a waste. Uh, Multi-agent chemotherapy for stage four cancer. Somehow we think again, more chemotherapy is better. It is not. The evidence is there. If they are asymptomatic and don't have uh, life threatening, in, in a, it is not necessary. But somehow, I don't know whether it is our training, but we tend to somehow ignore the evidence, but these patients have to pay for these treatments. And if they don't have to pay, it's a waste to the society. That money could be used for something else. And always remember that multi-agent has more side effects. We should remember that. So we are not doing the patients a favor by giving them more chemotherapy. The evidence is there, it's not a personal thing. So that is how we could, so these are part, these are things that we should be doing rather we rather do the, the opposite. Chemotherapy in clinically stable hormone positive metastatic breast cancer. 
we tend to think chemo is the answer. Is the answer only if after multiple you know, tries of chemotherapy, it fails. We don't have the other things for uh, um, um, resistance and um, um, people who are resistant to hormone therapy. We don't have parbocetib, it's not affordable. We can't have pasodex. So then you can switch to chemotherapy and that is allowed. Right. So we need to look at these. Uh, chemotherapy is not the answer right up front. And you need to take your time. It takes like three, four months for you to get a benefit. But we are all in a rush. And then we switch in, in, immediately. Quality of life is poor. Life is too short. Radiotherapy, bone metastasis, multiple versus single fraction. We could save so much money and that and save time on the machine for curative cases. Rather, we delay curative cases while these uh, metastatic patients are getting 10 fractions. There's so much evidence to support using a single fraction. And the beauty of it is that you can always repeat it. Of course, it has to be uncomplicated. People are waiting for one year to have their chemotherapy in most countries in Africa. And yet immediately they have bone metastasis. They are put on the machine for 10 days. All that collated could save somebody with, 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 um, with local disease. Poor uptake of hypofractionation, even in curative breast and prostate cancer. Okay, the evidence is there. Of course, you have to have the appropriate equipment. Okay, do no harm before you adopt this. And you can have a clinical trial before you adopt these um, uh, um, strategies. In terms of diagnosis, bone scan in early asymptomatic breast and prostate cancer saves a lot of time and money. Without discussing treatments, expected outcome, including com financial complement, we prior to starting any intervention, and we are all guilty of that because the clinics are heavy, but it's something that could actually reduce a lot of waste and then improve the quality of life of our patient and patient outcomes as well. And also in terms of supportive care, Olanzapid is so cheap, it's an oral antiemetic. It is in the latest ASPO guidelines, and yet we do not use it. And it's so cheap and it could save us a lot of money and improve quality of and outcomes. Our patients are going to be more compliant to their treatment and come in. And also, as Nazik said, blood transfusions. We are too happy to give blood transfusions. I think wherever we are, we should get together with our hematology colleagues to come out with guidelines for blood transfusions for our patients. We know some tumors require a minimum HB. No problem with that. For the other tumors, and sometimes even just delaying chemo by a week and putting on the appropriate therapies could increase their HB by one or two. So this is something that we should do to cost effective means instead of blood transfusions, because we all know that blood is actually like gold in most developing countries. So I think we can spare blood for those who really need it and improve the outcomes and the quality. They don't like it when they receive blood. It's also very expensive. So we also need to put the patient at the center of improving our outcomes and evidence-based care. So this is a busy slide. We've talked about this already, what you need to do to improve your um, available evidence, reading, appraisal, levels of evidence, go online, join the university for CPDs, listen to your patients, listen to your support network, which you don't have, it's changing, look at cost effectiveness, look at your patient outcomes, you can only do that through data, okay, look at your clinical judgment, your scope, your competence, apply sound clinical reasoning, okay, workshops, networks, we need to go and join other people to see how they practice, and we learn a lot from that. So just in summary, best research evidence is based on when it was done, not 20 years ago, not 10 years ago, that's something. And then the updates, we are not looking at the updates. So some time ago, atilosumab was recommended, now it's not. So we need to be updated on that. We can join free, ASCO is free. They send monthly updates. These are things that we can and, and tailor it to our situation. We should look at the risk benefit assessment of the intervention for our local consumption. Okay, we don't read the, the details of the paper. We tend to read just the abstract and don't look at the toxicity profiles. Okay, and look at what we might actually be worse off for our situation. The effectiveness of sometimes the benefit is one month. The benefit is two weeks at an astronomical cost. Why are we putting our patients through this? In terms of clinical practice, it has to be contextual based and you have to assess your context to know what is applicable or not and the appropriateness of your intervention where you practice. It is very important. And in terms of individual family values, look at the barriers to treatment, cultural, individual, and functional. So somebody has a performance status of four and is still getting multi agent chemotherapy. I don't think we are doing the patient any service. Okay, and then client preference. We are in the era of democracy. I call it democratic oncology. The patients have the power. For us who patients pay out of the pocket, especially they are the ones paying. I don't think we should drive treatments down their throats. 
They're gone at the era when the doctor decides that error is passed. It also affects outcome. It affects compliance because the patient is not going to come back because you have a unity of deciding what they should do. So I think it's something, it's time to listen to our patients. It's very important to do that. So what are the factors influencing? We've talked about this. So the fact, poor assimilation of updated information by workforce, lack of local health system research, poor skill sets among MDT teams, local guidelines are not prioritized poor visibility of local research, and then there are no policies to guide the code of practice. The fact is the oncology is still not considered as a specialty among many of our peers. So that's why the patients are not sent to us first to inform what should be done along the line. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm.